to another episode of Comic Contenders, where we compare one Singaporean and one international comic of the same theme and tell you whether we think it deserves the hype. I'm your host, DNC, and I'm here with my co-host, Nadra, who will be filling in for my usual co-host, Linging, for today. Our theme for today is fantasy comics, and we have two superstar comics with us for today. So the first one, the Singaporean one, is Sacred Guardians. Uh, this is by Adil Johari and illustrated by Alan Bay. And then the second one, the international one, is Squire by Sarah Alfagia and Nadia Shamas. Both really, really cool comics and we're very excited to talk about it today with our guest expert, Kang Jing. He's the founder of an independent comics imprint, Cairo Comics, here in Singapore. And basically, you've had quite a lot of experience creating your own fantasy worlds and graphic novels. Yep, so I have been drawing comics for about five years. Yep, so I have written and drawn some comics uh, related to fantasy. Mm -hmm. So maybe like uh, The War Marina, uh, some short stories like Destiny, and then my recent uh, comic book, which is called Zhao. Mm. Yep. It's quite interesting because your comic Zhao has a lot of historical and cultural context of like ancient China kind of built into it, even though it's fantasy. And similarly, we have these two comics, Sacred Guardians and Squire, which also has their own like unique cultural context as well. Like maybe I'll give you guys, you know, a bit of an introduction to both books, just so you all know. Squire, it follows the story of a 14-year-old Isa in an alternate Middle East. So she dreams of becoming a knight in the midst of this war-torn empire, but kind of Beyond, you know, the stories and promises of heroism, you know, the army has been telling her, um, it was also the only way for her to kind of become a citizen because she is part of a conquered territory. The empire conquered kind of her area and now she's been absorbed into the empire and she's a second class citizen. So she's trying to use this as a way to become recognized as a proper citizen and she has to hide her identity because of that due to all the discrimination and all the while while she's in the army she discovers that the stories they've been telling her are actually not that great after all the way it unravels is very very interesting it's quite a thought-provoking comic so it basically discusses identity challenging the idea of you know what you call an objective history and kind of the harsh realities of having to fight against great imperial powers so a lot of thoughtful topics we have here that Squire is dealing with. And for Sacred Guardians itself, it takes you into an alternate Southeast Asia. So both of them are dealing with real places, but alternate takes of them. In this alternate Southeast Asia, it is under the dangerous risk of a demonic invasion. One of the main characters, Dev, who is the last of his race of immortals still on the mortal plane, he kind of must race against time to gather the Sacred Guardians who is a team of five righteous young heroes chosen to defeat this demonic invasion. It's also very inspired by the rich history and cultures of Southeast Asia and so that it can create its own like unique brand of superheroes that we've really never seen before. It would be quite fun to talk about this book as well today. Now that we have a brief introduction to both books, I think we can start it off with our ranking for today. Okay, let's do Sacred Guardians first. How about that? Sacred Guardians, uh, we shuffle, prepare which one we want to do. Okay, okay. So just to explain the rating system a little bit, we have a very special one here at Comic Contenders. We just have three tiers. Okay. So the first one is called Kenla, which means this is okay. It was a moderately enjoyable read. So the second one is Best. So what that means is I like it a lot and it was a good time. And the third one is show. So basically what it means is like, oh, this is so amazing. It, I felt my soul leave my body, kind of like that. So I think let's decide what we want to rank Sacred Guardians. Three, two, one. How is it? Ooh. Okay. Am I gonna okay. get cancelled? <laughs> no, 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 no. <laughs> no, no. Adil and Ellen, who you know personally, are gonna come and beat down your door. Yep. Sorry, Alan. Okay, so I chose Ken La. So basically, it's a it's a decent read, but I wouldn't say like, you know, I really enjoy it a lot, a lot. Because I guess um, perhaps the target audience for this book is maybe towards the younger age uh, audience. So, uh, yeah, me being an older person, right? Uh, I don't really enjoy 
it as much because it doesn't really dive too deep into the characterization and, and so on and all the characters. Because after all, like Sacred Guardian, right, uh, we are talking about a team. So there are many characters to focus on, but perhaps it is because of the book length itself. So they have to sacrifice a lot in terms of building up the characters and so on. So yeah, so I really couldn't get into the characters too much. So even at the end when, you know, something happens to the characters, you don't really feel it. Or even for like, let's say between the characters, uh, it's a little hard to differentiate like the characters mm. from each other. For me, I personally like the art style in this. Because, I mean, one look at this, you know, there's so many details. I can never draw that many details, especially in a comic book with many pages, okay? It's torturous. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah, so... Alan's good at that. Yeah, details. Alan is very good and consistent. So this is very what I like about the comic book, that it has action scenes, it has, like, like backgrounds, like, everywhere, and as well as, like, the effects on the characters as well. I, I think the story also was quite enjoyable the part like oh they are willing to fight for the betterment of the world even if it's gonna cost something dear to them which i will not spoil now so i believe that like, this is such a good read for anyone to pick up my reasoning a bit similar to yours as well wherein it's a different target audience it's definitely for the younger ones so i felt like it didn't resonate with me that hard but I will say that when this book came out, I was very excited because, uh, and I'm still very happy that it exists now because we don't have a lot of fantasy in Singapore. Just comics wise, right? We, I mean, of course you create fantasy comics. Um, there is fantasy comics, but generally we tend to skew towards a lot of creative biography. Yeah. yeah. Like even just like online web comics. I mean, we've talked about it in our past episodes. You can see. Uh, it's always like we just talk about our lives in Singapore, our, you know, the landscape, our Singaporean lifestyle. But something original fantasy, something that's an original fantasy, right? We haven't really seen a lot of. So I'm very, I was very excited to see this and the fact that it was based on Southeast Asian cultures, which is very different from our usual superhero comics, mm. which is very, very like a Western idea, right? just your normal superpowers that maybe you get it from a, uh, maybe their genes or something yeah. like that, right? Yeah. And it's, it's your usual invisibility and whatnot. But here they have spirit guardians, very, very inspired by important sacred creatures within Southeast Asia as well. So that's very interesting. So we'll move on to Squire this time. Three, two, one. Oh, okay, I'm the owner. Why for me is short. Uh, first of all, I will say that this is the kind of comic that I want to create myself also. It's, it's a dream comic. Like if it were a graphic novel, if there, I had a graphic novel that I would want to do, this is the kind of work that I want, that I would make. Mm. The artwork for me is fantastic. I love the art style. I think it brings in a lot of really, it's really beautiful, colourful, very rich and vibrant. A lot of architectural and costume details, which from my background, I love to draw characters. Very inspiring to see. I love the way it deals with important themes. Like it's important themes of like imperialism, colonialism, history. I thought they were able to delve into it quite well. So overall, I had a really good time just learning about the characters, learning about the world. And I felt it was very rich and vibrant for me. But what about KJ? Right, so for Squire, right, I chose uh, Bass instead mm. of like Shook. But I guess it's closing towards the Shook end. But mm. I guess for me, it lacks a little bit. So mm. I agree with you in terms of like, it brings across like very important messages like uh, oppression, racism. And I think it does that quite well in the book itself. I like the art. Uh, artwork as well. It's very consistent throughout. I like the colours and everything. That is all very good. But the one part that perhaps let the book down for me is in terms of like the final act itself is like really, you know, the build out and then suddenly it drops off so much at the last act itself. Yeah, and mm. besides okay, that... I, I, I agree. Yeah, yeah, oh, yeah. Okay, we should go into yeah. that. I have like a lot of hot takes about that also. And then one more thing is really in terms of the concept of this, mm. uh, this army itself. Uh, because, I mean, technically, 
when we look at this, right, the, the army is trying to recruit soldiers from territories that are being controlled. Aiza is one of the soldiers. So, uh, in fact, one of the reward that they give to these soldiers is in terms of citizenship, uh, being able to have own the land, as, uh, sorry, own a house, own the land, and so on. But when we look at the people who enlist, right, they are mostly people who are already citizens. And then they are very shocked when they found that there is someone from the army that joins them. But isn't the entire concept of this enlisting people from the from these territories mean that we should be seeing more people from these territories coming to the army? Mm. Yeah, so I guess the concept of this army, enlisting in the army for this book itself, perhaps pulled down the score a little bit. But overall, I would say that I enjoyed the book itself. Mm. Oh, okay, but I guess it wasn't very clear, but it was like a new introduction, I think. They usually don't recruit from from the like the conquered territories. So I think usually everybody's very used to seeing people from the empire. Mm. And then this is supposed to be like a new initiative that you think they would be more used to, but I guess not lah. Yeah, I thought of it at first, but subs- as in at the start, right, Aiza also mentioned that mm. uh, she has been wanting to join the army for a few years. She has been talking to her parents for it about a few years. Mm. So I thought that it wasn't that new of an initiative mm. rather than like a newly launched kind of thing. That's fair. Yeah, so I guess the creators probably thought it through, but Perhaps it wasn't really laid out clearly in this mm. in this aspect. So the logic portion is a little just a little lacking. Okay, well, we should, let's let's talk a little bit more about that later on as well. Okay. What about you, Nefra? So as you know, I'm an artist. I have to look at the art. <laughs> but honestly, I love the art. And when I look at it, it kind of reminds me of webtoon, like how they like make some blanks. Like you know, when you read down webtoon, there's always like white white spaces, right? So. The book also has that as well, and it's smartly used, so it's not as confusing as not uh, not all sparse. So I enjoy it as much. I also the lighting of this. They put a lot of thought into the lighting, like maybe the cool colors are a more calming situation. But when it's like 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 red or orange, is where oh there's a fight scene, something like that. So something like it's kind of like something we have learned in like filming or cinematography that oh okay like cool cool is like okay the more calming tones and then like the the warm is for the more drastic ng uh, animation scenes and also i would like to point out that actually i enjoy the story as much because when i first read it i thought oh it's just a typical girl want to go on an adventure and like maybe like you know win some win some battles for the family and so on and then as i progress reading it then I realized, oh no, okay. Actually, it's not just and just any adventure storybook, uh, no story, uh, comic books out there. Actually, she learned that okay. Actually, the adventures and all that they have said is just you know, uh, spoiler alert, lies. So having to have this protagonist coming in with a mindset that okay, she's gonna be, she's gonna do good for the people around her and stuff like that. But then to realize actually she's working for the wrong people, and then that's something I really like when it comes to stories about protagonists. They come in with a mindset, and then the story changes them, and then they come out as a with a very new mindset, and then that's how character development works in stories. Like yeah, yeah. yeah. Yeah, that makes the story particularly compelling as well. Yeah, and I think Squire is very, very successful in doing that. Since we're on the topic of Squire, let's just continue talking about the story a little bit. So you mentioned that you had some issues with the story structure, right? Mm-hmm. Even though overall it was really, really, very interesting. What did you find was the issue there then? I guess for me, it's mainly really about the whole concept of this enlisting the, mm. the new enlistee to the, to the army itself or perhaps the military structure itself. Mm. So the first thing like, like I mentioned just now right, is uh, basically they are openly inviting those who are from the conquered territories to, to join them. So by right we should be expecting to see more people from such races or territories but essentially in the story we only see uh, Aiza being one, the only one and of course Perhaps the the other characters are not so not so important, so they are not even mentioned. It that was one part to it. Then the second portion is really in terms of the rewards. That what is the motivation for the citizens to really join here when the main reward was really uh, about citizenship? Because basically in the structure over here, right, only one of the recruits get to become 
a squire. And for a squire to then become a knight, it is basically just one of them. So essentially, if we were to look at a so-called military structure, right, then if we have a knight, squire and the rest becoming infantry then first thing would be the the motivation for the citizens to go through is very difficult because most of them are going to become infantry mm. which doesn't come with like let's say the fame or the rec- uh, recognition that they are striving for in a way then the second thing would probably be if so little of them become a squire then that would mean that the entire entire military would just be made out of perhaps one night and that seems a little awkward as well yeah but perhaps of course these details are not being focused on because that is not the main focus of the book yeah so it's really just the nitty-gritty details that maybe mm-hmm. like, just put me on a little bit you know i see i see but i thought my my impression was that they could become squires it just takes a very long time and a lot of training like two to three years it's not like one person i've always felt like okay spoiler uh, the reason why the general made aiza a squire so fast which is a record-breaking one. So usually in the world, they take about two to three years. And there's one guy who is one of her compan- like one of her peers who has been gunning for that position for, it, for, for, for his entire life. He didn't get it. And she gets it. Suddenly out of the blue. I've always thought that it was kind of like a political... She was just trying yeah. to stir political, something. Yeah, up, he, right? she was trying to stir something. Like the general trying to stir something. And it's not because they can only mm. be one. That was my impression though. Mm. But I guess it wasn't very clear, maybe. I guess because prior to that, there were some scenes that mentioned about or the rest who didn't make it to Squire, they will become an infantry. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah so, they'll be put in the front lines and then they'll yeah. die. So that was the portion that, that led me to have this mm. uh, thinking in terms of the structure might be a bit off. But I understand, I agree with you at the at the end when, they, when the general made her Squire instead of the rest. It's sort of like trying to turn the army against her or against the army in a way. I thought the way that they decided to do that was quite interesting. Because like when they made her a squire, situationally, there's that thing that people say, look like a model immigrant. It's like finding that one person and then using like, oh look, we have an Ornu. We have we have one minority. We are not discriminating like against- the poster boy Yeah, the poster kind. child, right? Yeah, so yeah. then like, look, this is a squire from the conquered territories. We're gonna now parade her around everywhere else so that to show like, look at how progressive we are. And that was the vibe that I got from here, which which is quite, which is quite a statement, right? For me, that storytelling wise that the, the authors, the creators decided to make. So how compelling do you find their fantasy worlds to be? So for fantasy, right, I would consider two aspects of it. One is in terms of the mythology or the, the cultural, the world building portion of it. And then the other portion is uh, maybe the action things. So for Squire, it is really more grounded, more, uh, you, you feel like it's a real world. Uh, very very close to you in a way where Sacred Guardian really delves more towards the so-called more magical fan, like the t- typically what you think of a fantasy kind of story but both does very well in their uh, respective uh, style of this this mytholo- mythology building in terms of action wise I think they are they, they did well as well I really like the way that they brought in a lot of those uh real world influences like for sacred guardians if you flip through um every time they introduce a new hero basically there are five sacred guardians uh. so in between each bo- uh, each part where they introduce them they'll have a short little section about the area they've come from and also kind of like the the history that's related to that particular area so of course there's singapore which is called Tumasik in here um they go talk they talk about thailand in uh, Java, Indonesia. So it gives you a little bit of a hint of realism that they've done here with Sacred Guardians. And then with Squire, they've brought in a lot of realism through the costuming and also the architecture with the kind of like influences in say the embroidery patterns, in their clothing and all that. All these give it a really nice touch and make the fantasy world feel very real. I gotta agree with Kanjim mm-hmm. here because Squire doesn't have any like transformation sequence like Power Rangers or anything like that. Yeah, uh, Sacred, Sacred Guardians, Guardians is more like, <laughs> yeah, a bit, I wouldn't call it magical girl, but they do transform. Yeah, mm-hmm. they do transform. So I do say that, yeah, I do agree with Kanjim that Squire is more grounded fantasy kind of where unlike 
unlike a sacred guardian who has these powers from the, the sacred animals and then having their own uh, powers and weapons along with it. So what do you think were... We've talked a little bit about the central themes of Squire just now, but what do you think are also some of the central themes of sacred guardians, for example? And then we can go into Squire's themes a little bit more as well. I think for Sacred Guardian, the central theme would probably be about heroes uh, sacrificing oneself, as in them sacrificing their lives for the greater good in a way. Mm. Yep. So it's really the standard flow of a so-called superhero kind of story whereby they put the needs of the people and the world above their own. Yeah, I would say like they it's a little bit more straightforward, like what Sacred Guardians has. Yeah. I feel like you have some some thoughts I on your <laughs> So regarding sorry, this I've been looking I'm so sorry um, <laughs> okay yeah Kanjing has a point here like sacred guardians the people that are chosen they know what they are doing they, they are willing to sacrifice everything for the betterment of the world but when you compare it to like okay squire squire they are willing to fight for their sample slot you know? like in the sense that they gotta get benefits from it but for sacred guardians they do not get any benefit from saving the world like <laughs> right <laughs> out of the kindness and goodness of yeah, their hearts but okay but if I were put in a position of like okay I'm gonna be a guardian of sacred guardians that would be a bad choice I will ask will I get paid <laughs> even if the life of everyone on the planet is at stake yeah but at least give me some money like. <laughs> give me something to they pay they excuse me like I need Need to I need to eat. Okay, I get it. It's for the better more exposure. <laughs> that part is, is also something that I found a little off-putting because oh. the characters just agree to so-called take up this role so easily. It's like, oh you just saved me from some strangers who are trying to kill me and then okay, I will join you to save the world. You know that kind of uh, yeah. yeah. So I, I don't know, I, I would like to put it to the book, the length of the book. Perhaps the, the mm. creators are limited to this number of pages so they have to complete the story within this number of pages and yeah. hence they cannot really expand the character so much but that becomes an issue in terms of like uh trying to make people feel for the characters because when i read through the central act which is basically death trying to trying to form his so-called avengers in a way yeah, yeah. Uh, everybody just agrees so easily yeah so. yeah and then not to mention they all die at the end so oh, oh spoiler, spoiler, spoiler. <laughs> Spoiler, spoiler, spoiler. Yeah, like I said, spoiler alert, they all die in the end, so it doesn't matter if you love them in the middle. So I'm sorry. Yeah, but the thing is when so so the issue becomes when they die, right? You don't really feel sad for them because you have never loved them. In <laughs> <your> way, <right? laughs> yeah, so I, I guess one way perhaps to, to circumvent this issue might be to reduce the number of characters so that you can have more pages for that limited number of characters rather than because it's essentially like a like a team book, but we only really get mm. focus on that. I guess it's like if you have oh this is my hot takes about DC and Marvel yeah. but this is like if you did the Justice League without giving each <laughs> of the characters an individual movie before you did the Justice League and I don't like it. Okay wait I'm gonna get cancelled by freaking Justice League stands although <laughs> what Marvel succeeded with the Avengers was that they have their each Avenger, they had this like really B, like that's like C tier, B tier heroes that nobody knows about. They give them each a movie, right? So okay, we know who Iron Man is, and now he's so yep. big. Then we know who Captain America is, and we care about them. And then they put all of these guys together in the one movie, and then ultimately when something, you know, when they fight, when they have conflict, we are engaged. Hmm. So I guess for here, because I would say it's a very challenging thing. They are trying to build a prologue to kind of the Sacred Guardians universe and have a basic understanding of what the Sacred Guardians are, right? But they don't have a lot of space to do that. So they, they have a challenge on their hands where they have to introduce so many characters at once, introduce the concept at once that like, maybe it does affect them, like the storytelling a little bit. Lah. So hopefully I, in the future, maybe if we get more out of you know this universe then we will get more in-depth exploration into the characters yeah maybe. perhaps they can have one book for each character oh, and then that I think, would have been cool yeah. yeah i was just thinking about that in the cab right here and i was like oh that would have been nice like and, and having it as a series from a publisher perspective uh, that means more people will keep reading and buying books from you <laughs> <laughs> it has a lot of promise uh. 
in terms of the world. So hopefully we get to see more of these kind of characters from them as well. We were talking about the central themes of oppression and racism and colonialism. Maybe we can also go into that a little bit. How did they approach the telling of these themes through the story? I like how the creators do it for Squire because they they set the main character as someone who is from this minority group and then the challenges that she has to go through. I like how they really like set her up at the initial stage. Right from the very first pages, we can really see from her daily life how she is so-called being bullied by by the citizens. So the creators managed to basically paint this picture of how the minorities live by showing it to you through their daily interaction with the with uh, between the characters and their family mm-hmm. members without like you know some sometimes creators might just just tell you do, yeah, yeah, yeah right just like, tell like you straight, in like, your and tell, captions you know? it's like oh this right. is how I live my day every day I do this every day I do that but they show it through a scene and then their interaction so you already get that background story mm-hmm. and then subsequently the readers can follow her journey through her days in the army and how she has to basically hide her identity from the rest of the citizens and so on along the story right we also get to see like how the military is not what they portray themselves to be you get to see like in a way like brainwashing propaganda during their training and so on the way they do it is very light-hearted perhaps it's not the correct word but rather something that is very subtle to you so they don't push it very strongly to you so as the reader right you really get to so called experience it yourself i guess like the feeling of that growing wrongness that Isa experiences we experience it too it's like hey you know there's something up yeah. with these guys yeah, that was quite effective. I really enjoyed that as well. General Hindi, right? When she first appeared, I have a bad feeling. Like, she's gonna be evil. Actually, she is evil. <laughs> uh-huh, uh-huh, uh-huh. Yeah, I don't know. She had this, like, I think... The, 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 the vibes. The vibe. Props to the character designer. Mm. Uh, like, she, they, they make it very subtle. Like, no one can suspect she's the bad guy. But she really is the bad guy. Mm. That she's like inciting all this like stir of how like people can argue each other in terms of like where they are from and stuff like that. So I really like appreciate how she actually be she was once a squire before. I think the comparison of this villain and this main character is very phenomenal. Like Aiza is gonna be a squire, but she was a squire and she decided to use that. Uh, squire status to be someone of like maybe a higher rank and unlike her Aiza doesn't want to follow her footsteps so I think that is something like I love oh, this the parallels like, are the parallels. really good yeah. yeah because they had the same mentor as well and then you see like okay that is one path that Aiza could have taken she could have become this she general but she chose something else. She wanted to break the cycle of violence, right? She didn't want to continue on in that path. And I thought that like, she, these were young uh, youngsters trying to find their place in the world. Yeah. And this is a very challenging thing that they have to take on, which is like, these are the powers that are above us, these imperial powers. They built their societies. This is all they, they've known since they were young. And then they said like, no, we don't want that anymore. For that, I really admire like the fact that the authors brought in these themes because you know, young people, a lot of young people nowadays, they're also really politically aware, right? They have movements that they are interested in as well. And I think, you know, when we read and consume stories like that, we also think about like how we can contribute in the world as people. And I thought that's very, very interesting. You talked about the character design, so I'm very interested to go into that. <laughs> So let's talk about favorite character designs, okay? So I kind of want to go first because you talked about General Henry. Right, yeah, she is my favorite character oh, designer. Okay. okay, so she's a villain, but she's so mommy. I love her. She's so mommy. Oh my god! I will show. I show. I show you guys how the. She has like gray hair and like a plate. Cap hair. She's by the so way. instant. Like she braided. Yeah. Me. Okay. I have to try and find the page right now. Ah, here. It's a bit hard to see. Perhaps you can show it on screen later like uh so maybe, maybe, maybe. yeah but yeah she's just so cool because her costuming is inspired by i think old armor from the ottoman empire so they played paid a lot of attention to that so they showed a lot of the working process behind the character design to the back of the book so you know nerd like i'm a nerd i love when a comic book does this they really go into like the making of the comic and everything but general handy was so cool 
she was just so cool like the way that she talked i like i knew she was evil i knew she was up to no good but i was also like yeah do it more you know when the story's so good you have to cheer for the no, villain also okay <laughs> sometimes sometimes the villain is just compelling like that this is why people you know stand villains they are morally gray um yeah also she was she was also really hot when she was younger yeah so i, I she was my favorite character design for sure what about you guys though? I like the character, basically the one that uh, trains Aiza over here, this guy. Yeah, oh he's right. so like huge and bulky, I love him. So basically, because even though his costume looks very plain, mm. like, nothing nothing stands out really from the costume itself. But I feel that the design with the arms broken, right? Just by looking at this character, you know there's much more to him he's than- He's scarred. Yeah, it's like, it's like he's not just someone who's taking care of the armory just from the look of this uh, design itself. Yeah. yeah, so when a design can hint to you that there's more behind this character, then I think it's a very good design. Mm. Yeah. What I like about the protagonist is that she is a common girl. Like, anyone could look like her. And actually, maybe the youngsters could relate. Like, like we always want to find something that we are destined to be and we want to grow up to like, make parents proud. She wears like, just a common clothes and nothing too fancy or anything like that. She's just a girl who wants to go on an adventure. And this book actually shows that, and which mm. I really love. Do we have a favorite Sacred Guardian? Um, I know I do. Okay, Sacred Guardian, I, I would say my favorite character would be him, the Chang, I think. Chang, Chang Nim. Nim. Yeah, I mean, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, the small boy, he's but 20. he's the oldest, right? Yeah, I mean, yeah, yeah. yeah. So I like him because his character shine through this mm. design. And then, of course, him being the smaller size, uh, as compared to the rest of the of the characters, you sort of like feel that cheer, cheery, cheerful vibe mm. from him. Yeah, so so that attracts me to this character the most. Even though I don't really like the elephant transformation of his, I prefer the singer. Yeah, yeah. the singer is the most iconic one, so that makes sense. My favorite one is the bird. Oh, her. She, so Nie, that's Niana's transformation. Niana, she's this the female character here. She uses the bow, and I love bow and arrows. It's my favorite weapon out of like all of the weapons when you use in fantasy. Bow and arrow, love it. If that character uses a bow and arrow, you're my favorite character. If there's a bird related imagery, I love you too. So basically, I was a Hunger Games fan, unrelated, but yeah. So you like Katniss Everdeen then? Yeah, I did like Alice. I did, I did. She, I was just like, oh, she's so cool. Back when I was had my Hunger Games phase, of course, and, and yeah. But, but the new movie is coming out, so I was like, or oh, came out already? I don't know, but I'm looking forward to watching it. But anyway, back, back to this. Yeah, I love when characters have like wings as well. So I, I'm just kind of biased. I like, just kind of hitting all the things that I like at once. <laughs> so ends up becoming my favorite. I particularly like this man over here wearing this mask. Oh, Ari. I like the mysterious oh my man gosh. vibe. Sorry. Yeah. No, I love him too. Yeah. Okay. I was like, oh, his lover died. And I'm like, yes, he's single. I can. <laughs> <laughs> and then he died in this story. I'm like, okay, never mind. <laughs> It's okay, fan fiction. I'm gonna make my own hit can and then we get married. I don't know, maybe. I'm, yeah, I'm sorry, yeah, I, ideal. Yeah. <laughs> no, he maybe he lived he out of all of them, you know. When I first read this comic, I didn't know if Ari was a guy or not. Because they never use pronouns for Ari at all. Like, And then I was like, so is he a guy? Is he gender neutral? Is he a woman? So, and the, the design is quite androgynous as well. So I was never sure. In the end, I did get a confirmation that he was a guy. But before I got the confirmation, I was very like, ooh. <laughs> that this is quite interesting indeed. It's a guy, it's a guy, it's a guy. It's a guy. I it's I nope. would think so. It's a guy, but I definitely thought it was kind of androgynous looking. Not because of the long hair, but because like his general shape was quite androgynous yeah. as well. So I, I enjoyed that character design. Yeah. So props to Ellen B. Do you think both comics will stand the test of time. Yes, definitely. At least for Squire itself, right? I would say that uh, because of the themes of oppression and racism, I mean, these are these are issues that are very real to the world. Mm. As much as we like to believe that, uh, I mean, we have racial harmony or stuff like that. Mm. I mean, there would be degrees of racism, discrimination everywhere, and it's mm. it would be as in it has happened happened in the past. It's happening now, and definitely it will continue to the future. Mm. And Squire being a story that is not fixed in, like let's say, a modern day kind of setting, it will definitely 
still be relevant in the future. Mm. And as for Sacred Guardian, I would say that it will also stand the test of time because of the setting in terms of the mythology, they are using historical fi- uh, historical facts as the background, as the myth of the story. So in a way, maybe 100, 200 years down the road, these are still facts. And then, in fact, it, will, it might even become more rich by then. Mm. So I guess the story would become better with with, with time in fact. Mm. Yeah, so honestly, we've talked a lot today about Sacred Guardians and Squire and the central themes and also the art that we really like. So make sure you check this out yourself, you know, see if you agree with us or not. And both of these have really, really timely themes, especially Squire. I think uh, both of the creators are Arab American, so they've brought in a lot of their own personal experiences into the story. And I find the themes more timely than ever. So make sure you check it out. We have links to both books in our description. As always, uh, before I wrap up though, we do have a special gift for KJ. Yeah. Yes. It's not a surprise anymore. Really, no. <laughs> yeah, but oh, it's a. It could be a surprise still. I don't know. Something. Yeah. And take a look at this unboxing. Right? We gotta do the unboxing. So I'm looking forward to what Nadra draws. Oh, is this on my profile pic, right? As in, you drew the one. Thank you. Yay. Got your own personalized mark. We don't even get those. We just get the, <laughs> the normal ones. So this is actually our last episode of Comic Contenders. If you want to see more, let us know in the comments. Hopefully we can come back and promote more Singaporean comics to you and also talk a little bit more about international comics as well. So as always, like, comment, subscribe, share with your friends, and we'll see you guys again next time. Bye-bye.